Hello. Hello, everyone. Greetings. Hello. I'm Skylar Earl. I'm here to, to fill airtime for the next 60 seconds while we check the levels. Uh, how is everyone doing? So I want to remind you, uh, this is the most tightly packed... You just stole my seat. That's okay. <laughs> no, sorry. It's okay. I just, uh, I, this is the most tightly packed session I've seen at this entire conference, so I want to remind you, uh, th think back to what Vasily said this morning. Smile at the person next to you. It costs you nothing. <laughs> so be kind to one another and easy with the elbows. Uh, so. So uh, uh, I just want to, uh, to take a moment to thank you all for coming, uh, and I give you uh, uh, Mikola Kozir. Thank you, Mikola. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, that's huge. Thanks a lot for coming here. Uh, I was not expecting to see so much people here. Uh, I don't know. Even the presentation is not very good. At least I know how to create great topics. So you know, <laughs> it, I, I hope it would work. Uh, okay, so I'm product manager in Spectrum.com. I'm not sure if you know what it is, but probably you would check then and try uh, what we are developing. Uh, yeah, actually, what would be I'm talking about is the heat maps. So just to clarify, the heat maps that I would be talking about is on the right part of the screen. So it's probably the mo more like common representation of heat map for cartographers, but uh, there is like common statistical methods to visualize features there is on the left part, so uh, I would be talking about the, the, the right part. So I hope nobody just decide to leave at this moment, so let's continue and work there. So the heat map is actually the uh, data visualization for the density, usually for, for points density on the, uh, on the map. And here is the nice uh, like picture from the Vladimir Agafonkin blog on Mapbox.gl. Uh, and actually, what's the reason to talk about the heat maps? Um, as I told, we are developing a software that's the cloud-based platform to work with location data and analysis. Uh, so by analysis, I actually mean analysis. We do provide some geostatistical methods to work with the location data, which allows to, like, to discover data more than just visualizing it. And uh, we had a lot of requests concerning adding the heat map as the visualization method. And I was wondering what's the reason for that, because I actually do not like a lot of them. But as I found, a lot of businesses, a lot of like our users and customers are actually using it quite a lot. So uh, we decided to check how actually they are using them and to understand whether we need to implement this feature in our software. And uh, here is a couple of cases where when our customers wanted to use the heat map to discover some patterns and to find some uh, clusters, etc. So I would just stop on a couple of them. Uh, here is the first one. That's for geomarketing. Our customer wanted to find the area uh, with like the most attractive area within the city to uh, spread their businesses in these areas. They got some points of interest, the points of attractions. It was like some bus stops, some schools, universities, etc., etc. And uh, they wanted to visualize it, and actually they did uh, on the heat map. Here you can see on the left part. And my question, question was, really, is it what you wanted to see? I mean, there is nothing to see here, so you cannot make any decisions based on this heat map. Therefore, what we actually made with them together, we built it just a simple grid over the city area, uh, then counted the number of features per every square, and then run the quadrant analysis. So the quadrant analysis allow us to understand not just the areas where there is a high intense of features, but also to understand which distribution type is actually within this uh, like data set, because there is no need to find clusters in the data set if the data set is not clusterly distributed. So therefore, they were satisfied enough with this solution. And at this moment, I decided to go deeper into other cases. Uh, we've got the second one. Here is uh, the visualization of 100,000 points on the map. And we also, the task was to define the areas where people were, came from to the peninsula. Uh, so uh, as you could see on the heat map, there are a lot of like red regions here and you could not actually compare them. So they look pretty much the same as this, at a lot of areas. 
But what we've done, we actually also built the vector grid and counted the number of features per every sector and then used the MemboxGL uh, rendering to also to put this vector into the third dimension. Therefore, it was easier to compare the absolute values within, within features. And you could see that these like red parts are actually quite different from, from other red parts. So uh, comparing these two visualization, you may see that the heat map is really simplifies the visualizing features and it really do not show the pattern that is expecting to be shown by using other visualization techniques. And here we use the nested means classification, which is quite good for the long tail histogram. Uh, therefore, even the colors we used is like two hue uh, color ramp uh, also show even better than the heat maps, which is used the railbow uh, color ramp, which I would be talking about a bit later. So it's also like uh, the pain, I believe, for every cartographer. Uh, okay, uh, the third uh, case we also met in Ukraine. There is a car accidents map, uh, which we used to, to, to find solution, to find decisions where to put the TrueCam patrols. TrueCam is the uh, active radar where for police officers, which are actually staying on the road and trying to, uh, like to find whether the car is moving within the speed uh, limits. And as you could see, it's like the whole city is in a mess. So I, I have no idea how they just try to uh, to find the the places to put these uh, patrols. And here is uh, our map with uh, blue lines, uh, which shows where actually they put these patrols. And on the our map, we also made a grid, but uh, instead of just counting the number of features, we run the uh, clusters and outliers analysis, also known as local Moran's eye analysis. Therefore, this analysis allows you to see the clusters of high values, clusters of low values, as well as outliers. So if there are some uh, road parts which have uh, a bit different number of uh, accidents comparing to the nearest one, it would be the outlier. And as you can see, comparing these two results, actually the main patterns uh, remain in the same. So uh, the middle part of the city is red as well as in the heat map. But using the analysis techniques, you could see that there are some specific regions where it is significantly higher number of accidents and it is recommended to put patrols actually on this area. So it's here on the north part of the city and also here on the south part of the city. Uh, that was also the case. And the fourth case uh, that we also met during these heat maps requests uh, was, about the, uh, was about the time series analysis. So that's also about the vector, type, vector data. Uh, we we found that the issue was to to find uh, clusters of uh, crimes analysis uh, and to visualize it on the map using the heat map. I mean, they wanted to find the sparks of crimes in some specific areas. But what we've done and what we are also talking about that location data analysis is not just about maps. That's also about charts. That's also about some indexes. And here you could see the chart that's showing actually the blue line is the, it's like the histogram number of features per some specific uh, time range. And the red one is the number or the nearest neighbor index. So which shows uh, to what extent the features occurred are close to each other. So it shows the number of cluster to these features. Therefore, as you can see, uh, the high value of, or in this case, uh, a big number of uh, thefts and other crimes does not mean that they actually taking part in one in one territory and it is really hard to uh, find some clusters just by visualizing the features using the heat map and then running it into the histogram uh, therefore when you got this uh, nearest neighbor index you could see whether there is like some some uh, like the graphs go down and it means that some features are at this point, and at this point, some crimes locations tended to be closer to each other, and it is the next step to create a map visualization, 
and actually uh, find this cluster. But it's, it's another task. So at this moment, uh, what we are talking about is uh, there is no need to start with the map, uh, but you should start with like other analysis techniques and then move to the map just to find the place. And here I would share the uh, libraries that we developed for building the uh, time series analysis. That's more easier to build analysis on the daytime range, so you could just, it's like time pretty breaks, so there is no need to define your own times uh, sections. It's much easier to work with your entire time, uh, time series and then divide it into the relevant sectors. So feel free to uh, go there and work it. It's open source, yeah, definitely. Uh, and it would be there in, in the last slide also. Uh, okay, so what actually is the reason of not using heat maps, yep, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, and uh, what about the heat map, how it works? So here is the representation of the histogram for some data set. So you could see that there are some features here, uh, like the black lines. And how the heat map works, it actually builds some sort of the kernel function. It's usually the Gaussian function. And then it multiplies and creates this density graph which is actually representing on the screen of the map. Uh, so even here you could see that if there are some features are actually located quite uh, in a quiet of distance, uh, it does not work very well. And here you would see on the next slide, that's the pitfalls of using the heat map. Uh, it's even it's not probably the better the best slide, but it shows how it could work wrong. Uh, just imagine if there are like the number of features or there is one feature for each of the cycle, uh, you would see for some, I mean, for some specific radius of the influence, there would be a, like a place when you would have the highest value for this kernel function in the territory, which is not actually has any features. So that's probably the main thing that you should think about and uh, it uh, would not work with the, like on the local level, uh, even, this is a representation of the uniform uh, kernel, but for any type of kernel, you would find this distance where on the local level, you would have this overlap and misleading. So y your research would not show the appropriate results. And at this point, you'd better not using the visualizing at all. So because it's, it would harm your, your results. Uh, for that, I would recommend as the first point, if there is a task to find some clusters, to run the nearest neighbor analysis just to understand whether uh, the distribution type is clustered, because if there is a task to find clusters, we need to understand it, uh, that the data set is clustered, and then the next, the next actually task is to find where, where are these clusters. So when you run a nearest neighbor analysis, uh, you're getting the results, and then you could run the quadrant analysis and finding the distribution type. Uh, it is the vector grid. Uh, of course, it also has some problems for the uh, like working because the quadrat size is still another question. I would also stay, stop on, on the task. Uh, but uh, at least there are no over overlapping features and uh, this issue could be fixed by using the quadrat analysis techniques. Uh, Another one, if you are not just working for the, like, researching the intents of data, but you also want to find the actually clusters and outliers within your data set, I am recommending to use the clusters and outliers analysis, uh, which uh, would return the data into four categories. It's actually the clusters with high values, clusters with low, low values, and then outliers. Outliers, I mean the high values surrounded by low values or low values surrounded by high values. And within this, the whole data set range, you could normalize all, all the features and find the patterns among all the data set and continue working with your representation and take decision based on the analysis. And it would be much more sufficient to, to, to move forward. Uh, yeah, here are some cases. Okay, this, the, this the, the next one, uh, it's just, it's crazy. Um, that's the color. Uh, I would not stop a lot at this moment, but the general idea, just do not use the railbow because 
it's really not a very good idea. I am attaching the link to the great article by Lisa Charlotte Rost about the hue-based gradient. The main idea is that it is really not very good for people people's eye to identify this uh, like middle regions between the main the main colors. It's the red, green, and and blue, so it would not work very well for people's eye to understand this color ramp, and therefore it is not very good, of course, for people with uh, color blindness. Therefore, it is w much more recommended to use one hue or even two hues, just to like to show this diverging uh, or sequential uh, data distribution. Uh, yeah, area of influence. That's another pain because. Uh, at first, uh, also as I said, we, we are a cloud-based solution, so we are mostly focusing on other cloud-based solutions. And for a lot of cases, they are using pixels and other canvas uh, systems to render this heat map. And as you may imagine, pixel is nothing in, ge ter in, in geographical terms. So you could not adjust pixels actually to, to any territory to understand which areas are neighboring and they could and should influence on uh, influence on each other on the other hand it's quite easy to move from like a disaster to some small local issue that could be you know just fixed by anyone so it is very manipulative to work with the heat maps and it doesn't since it does not have any geographical background as the distances as the neighboring distances it is very often misused by journalists, by some propagandists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, that's the reason it is not the best idea to use it. Another thing uh, about pixels also, and uh, the the neighboring distance. So pixels, as the previous slide, it's the settings that is like showing the area of influence, but. Uh, which area of interest should we use? And actually, that's the question. And in most cases, you're just working with some, you know, you just imagine, so, okay, let's take 500 meters, but why? Uh, so there is a common usage recommended distance to uh, understand what is the distance between points should be considered as neighboring distance and the distance of the influence. Therefore, there is a formula, it's from NumPy, uh, but uh, it takes into account the number of features of this data set row count and also the area of the polygon of distribution. So if, if you are working with the data set on the city, you should not take the bounding box because you know the, the area would be a huge difference. And also uh, you should uh, just find the real area of the territory. Uh, another one, sorry, is the map projection. It's also about the pixels somehow. Uh, for this point, you could see, for example, here is a huge cycle over the Europe, and you may imagine that actually it does not work in the real wo world like this, because we should count distances on the Earth's surface. Uh, therefore, uh, it should be a huge distortion of this cycle. It should not be a cycle, because for SaaS products, uh, people usually use the Mercator, so the Mercator uh, CRS, therefore, it does not work very well, and it also misleads the researcher, because on this global scale, your features would would overlap, but on the real distances would be completely different. Uh, so here is the slide for the overlapping, uh, not overlapping, but changing the distortion, changing the uh, CRS. Therefore, uh, what we use in our analysis, because we are building the platform for like everyone, uh, we are using the Vincenti formula for the uh, measuring distances, which works quite well on ellipsoid. And uh, we actually open sourced this formula and uh, these algorithms to measure distances between nearest points. So it could be easily implemented in any solution. And it is the like, nearest neighbor analysis based uh, on the calculations based on CUDA. So it's on the GPU and it works quite well. Uh, I'm recommending to read the article for my friend and also, yeah, the backend developer uh, of the product. Uh, so what he released is actually the algorithms that works extremely fast 
it's building the ball tree and then works in going down down to find the nearest neighbor and the distance to this nearest neighbor and it works extremely fast so you could count the distances to like three three million features within one minute on the uh, nvidia as far as i know it was 1060 yeah so it's even not the newest one uh, so here is uh, the pip uh, repository and also the github so feel free to use it in any applications uh, yeah that's the general information to sum up what i i was talking about so first of all uh, before using the uh, visualizing methods to find clusters you should understand whether this data set is clusterly distributed therefore i'm recommending to use a nearest neighbor analysis you can find uh, and you could, you could use this rep repository for the vincenti cuda nna also using appropriate area of influence parameter and measuring distance settings that's the formula that was also on slides because uh, yeah, area of influence, influence should be a geographical unit for visualization. Uh, also, do not use railbow. Use the one or two hue color ramp for visualizing. It's much easier to understand the differences between uh, some middle, middle, middle ranges. Uh, also, use the local Moransi analysis to define clusters and outliers. It may normalize all the data and it may show some local changes between uh, in the middle of inside the data set. So it would show the insights of the data. Also, uh, I did not mention in the slides, but if you have some weighted heat maps, so you are using some column in your uh, points data set to build a heat map, it's better to use the Gettys or GI star analysis just to find these areas with high values and low values. It works very really well and is, it is also could be used by using the PySAL. It's the uh, library for the data analysis. Here is uh, extremely, I believe, valuable links for the interesting uh, stories research etc etc and you may see the open source stuff that we are contributing thanks a lot uh hope it was interesting somehow to somebody yeah thanks <laughs>
I, I would try to understand by myself. Your question was uh, about the presentation of the methods for. Yeah. To explain what's adequate or not regarding the data. Do you have also, does it work with any audience? Like, or do you have things you say, I wouldn't use that for all audience because maybe it can be misunderstood? Uh, for the cases, probably, yes. In, uh, yeah. Uh, so the question was about the, uh, the different represent different visualization approaches it could be used instead of heat maps and how our clients and our, are actually. Uh, take it into consideration. So, uh, or I'm not sure, but uh, by the way, uh, yeah, uh, actually we are, yeah, just from, from behind, we are a B2C solution, but for the B2B cases that we are using, uh, it's still common that they are trying to, uh, our clients use our uh, specialists to, to build the case together so they are quite okay when we are talking to them that it's not probably the best solution for you, let's go to another solution. But unfortunately, it's just for a couple of cases because we could not communicate with everyone definitely. So uh, probably writing some articles and making presentations would, you, know, you would allow to, to, to move from there. Ah, another question. Yeah. Uh, about the, the, the heat map and the grid uh, representation, when you change scale uh, with the heat map, people like, like it, I think, because uh, it changes according to the scale, which I, I hate, but it, it did. And they don't like the grid because you just see one big uh, cell uh, when you're uh, at high uh, scales, and perhaps that's the, how they, they see it. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I think it could be fixed, and it's already fixed in Kepler GL. It's an Uber visualization platform, so they do this aggregation, I mean, the grid visualization on the front, on the front end. Therefore, it could be also uh, set up to the, like, on-fly re-rendering the grid. But we, uh, it's still, at the Kepler GL, they are using the pseudo Mercator, so we are facing the same issue with the, with the grid size. But it's interesting to create it on the front end, I think, and to run it uh, directly on the client side, it, it would be on the fly. So it, technically it's possible, I think it would be work. Okay, thanks a lot. Right, thank you very much, well done. One more round of applause, everyone, please, thank you.